Okay, hi. Um, good afternoon for those of you who are in Minnesota um, and the United States and Erev Tov for those of you who are in Israel. Um, I know that we have people from all over the world um, tuning in for this conversation. And on behalf of uh, the JCRC, the Jewish Human Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas, and our co-sponsors, uh, the Minneapolis and St. Paul Jewish Federations, the Israel Center, and TC Jew folk, um, welcome. Thank you for giving us some of your time and your attention. Um, and we are really grateful um, that, that you're here. I am Ethan Roberts. Um, I'm Director of Government Affairs for the JCRC. Uh, I'm here with Sally Abrams, who is my friend and colleague at the JCRC, as well as a prolific and popular and influential blogger with the Times of Israel. And Sally and I are so grateful that we are joined tonight, um, or to today for us in the United States, um, with David Horowitz, who is the founding editor um, of the Times of Israel, and Sarah Tuttle Singer, who is the uh, new media editor. Um, they've accomplished a lot, but I, our assumption is if you're here, it's because you want to hear from them and we don't need to sell you on, on Sarah and David. And so we're going to kind of just dive um, a little bit into the program in just like one minute. So if this was not um, this exceptional time that we're all living through, we would be busily planning at the JCRC for David to be coming to the United States. Um, he was supposed to be our annual event speaker on June 7th. Obviously, we're not having an in-person annual event this year. The good news is David is here with us today. Uh, the better news is that being hopeful, uh, we are going to have an annual event in 2021, and David is going to be our speaker. He's agreed to do that, and that will be on June 6th. Sarah has been to Minnesota. We've brought her here uh, in 2018. We look forward to seeing you back here as soon as, as possible. Um, so just to give folks uh, an outline of what we're going to accomplish over the next 40 minutes, uh, which is when we're going to have our kind of our conversation that we've sort of planned out, and then we'll reserve the last 20 minutes for, for your questions, which you can share um, in the chat feature. Uh, we want to talk a lot about COVID-19, but not in the sort of Dr. Fauci sort of way, not in a way that's like hyper-political, but the opportunity that COVID-19 is creating for us to uh, have deeper connection despite the physical distancing. Um, and so we're gonna ask uh, David and Sarah, both Sally and I are gonna take turns asking them the questions about uh, sort of the exceptional experience Israel's having. Uh, that will be the first question. The next question will be about how it's changing the work of the Times of Israel. And then we wanna dive deeper into two questions. One is um, how Israelis are kind of coming together in, in one of the areas where it's been difficult um, between Jewish Israelis and non-Jewish Israelis and how COVID-19 might be facilitating more uh, sense of Israeliness. And then we're gonna ask about the possibilities and opportunities that we're seeing for connection between Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis especially, but not just Jewish Israelis and, and um, Jews living in diaspora. We're gonna get through that. We're gonna answer uh, your questions or they're gonna answer your questions and we're gonna wrap up in an hour. So. With that out of the way, um, thank you again to everyone who's online. I'm Ethan Roberts from the JCRC. The first question is for David. And um, look, you guys have a, a tally on your on your website on on Times of Israel um, about how many cases you have, how many people uh, have, have 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 perished, and you know by any standard, you know Minnesota standards or American standards, um, you're doing exceptionally well, um, especially, you know, compared to us in the United States. And then we're curious, um, what, what accounts for that? Um, what are the best theories as to why Israel is um, just seemingly doing so much better than, than much of the world when you account for population density or, you know, any other factors you could compare? Okay, so I'll, I'll try and answer that as best I can. First of all, hi, um, thanks for inviting uh, Sarah and me onto this. And I do look forward to seeing you next year in person. Please God, that should be eminently feasible and not remarkable in any way. Um, uh, let's hope so. I think there's an awful lot we still don't know, um, but um, you know, let's give ourselves room for some optimism. Even some of the more pessimistic forecasts talk about vaccines and treatments, you know, in the, in the coming months. So let's, yeah, let's be optimistic. 
Uh, Israel has done spectacularly well, um, and I can't explain all the reasons. I can tell you some of the things that we've done, and I can tell you some of the comparisons that underline it. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you a little insight that, that you know, the, the prime minister put himself front and center of this battle. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, incredibly controversial figure, about to um, become prime minister again, um, widely liked and with plenty of detractors as well. In this crisis, you really have to be, uh, I think, misinterpreting reality to, to not appreciate um, the front and center success that he's had. And on Monday, when he was basically announcing the, la the latest set of, of easings of regulations, uh, he mentioned that when he was um, studying at MIT in the 70s, one of the first um, lectures that he had in a statistics class um, was one in which the, the teacher, the lecturer, uh, discussed the exponential nature of the spreads of viruses. And uh, he said on Monday, you know, that was like that lecture was etched into my mind. And when he heard about COVID-19, when he first heard about it, uh, he remembered that lecture and the way he put it, you know, that class has saved a lot of lives. Um, he stopped shaking hands on the campaign trail uh, in, in February. Um, Israel was among the first countries to advise its citizens against non-essential travel. Um, we pretty early uh, closed off the airport um, to non-Israelis or people whose lives are not centered in Israel. Um, so I think that was part one of, of maybe the three crucial factors to bear in mind. Pretty early, in, in trying to stop more contagion entering the country. Then I think the second thing that we did pretty early was the sort of stay home um, regulations. I don't think we were the first in the world by any means, but we were pretty early. And Netanyahu, um, deliberately or not, was, was pretty scary. Um, you know, you can look back and even at the time, um, it seemed, uh, well, it wasn't widely accepted that it was plausible that um, tens of millions of people would die around the world. But Netanyahu invoked the Spanish flu, and he did, he did intimate that it was possible, given the exponential nature of virus spread, that tens of millions uh, could die around the world. And certainly, you know, he, he and his health ministry chief spoke of tens of thousands of Israeli lives being at stake. And he also, you, you know, anyone who's watched Netanyahu over the years knows how articulate he is. Uh, he talked about, you know, if you want to keep your, your elderly relatives, especially your parents and your grandparents, you want to keep them alive, don't go near them. Um, and that was pretty scary. And I don't know how leaders communicated in other countries. I've, I've, I've seen stuff. Um, I think Netanyahu conveyed a mix of, I know what I'm talking about, and take me seriously to some effect. And Israelis, who are not the, the world's best, uh, most disciplined people, and who are very huggy and kissy, we kind of listened in, in, a, in a generally overwhelming way, I would say. And then the third thing that we should uh, highlight here is, was, it is, was somewhat controversial, but very effective, which is digital tracking of um, the populace uh, through emergency regulations, so that what this means, and I, I, again, I, I know there are similarities elsewhere, but I, I suspect Israel was pretty good at this, um, takes a while for symptoms to, to develop, right? But if you're tracking everybody's phone, then a few days later, when somebody turns out to be confirmed as a carrier, you can go back and find who they were in proximity hmm. to for you know 10 minutes or so and people got messages sms messages on their phone saying you've got to go into self-quarantine now because unbeknown to you you were pretty close for a pretty long time to somebody who's turned out to have the virus so i think those are big factors i think a health service which is underfunded nonetheless is staffed by some pretty amazing people we had screw-ups communications with the ultra-orthodox population were not good it took them longer than it should have done if the people in charge had done their job better in explaining to them the gravity of the crisis. On, on the, on the, on, on, generally, they weren't extreme or obdurate or resistant. They just didn't, they, they weren't explained properly what was going on. Once B'nai Brak, 200,000 people, densely populated, once they got the message, you know, they, they shut down. Uh, the, and the mayor, you know, praised the army just before Independence Day last week for, for helping them through the crisis. So it wasn't without mess ups, but we, we were pretty good. And just to stress to you how good we were, relatively speaking, I mean, you know, the most obvious uh, comparison to make, I, I should make is with the United States. The United States, I think your population is about um, 36 times um, Israel's, right? We're nine point something and you're 300 something. And I think you've had um, 36 times as many deaths as we have. 
Um, sorry, I think you've had 300 times uh, as many deaths as we have, um, when you're only 36 times the population. Uh, take, take a look at Belgium and Sweden, two countries with similar-ish populations to us that took very different tax. So Sweden didn't close down, but it's had a death toll far above 2,000. Uh, Belgium did close down, but it's had a death toll of around 7,000. Israel's death toll is around 239 when I last checked. I mean, that is, that's a smaller death toll than the toll in the Jewish community of Britain, which is only 300,000 people, and we're nine point something million. So by any comparat comparison, whatever that mix of things that I said, and I don't know if climate is in there, and I don't know if our health professionals are somehow better and I certainly don't think that we are massively better disciplined than other people. And we certainly had screw ups. Nonetheless, the Israeli results to date are, are astounding. Sarah, is there something you'd like to add to that, to what David said? And if yes, go for it. And if not, we'll move on to the next question. We're fine? Okay. So let's talk about Times of Israel. Let's talk about what the challenges are to this news organization in this unprecedented time, the opportunities, uh, what stories are generating the most interest. Tell us a little bit about your work, your challenges and opportunities in this very news-centric moment. Well, first of all, Sally, Ethan, it's wonderful to see you virtually, and I wish we could meet in person. I hope very, very soon that will be the case, Sally, I read with so much gratitude your blog piece about wanting to visit Israel and being sad about this, your delayed trip. And hopefully, God willing, for Sukkot or in the following year, we'll be able to meet in person and walk through Jerusalem as we have in the past. And uh, Ethan, it's always wonderful to connect with you online. And I look forward to seeing you in person again. And I'm thrilled to be here and sharing this uh, opportunity with David. So thank you for having me. You know, Times of Israel is uh, covering a whole array of stories, from the political, from our the issues with the new government, to COVID-19. But one of the things that's really come to light now, especially as we've launched this Times of Israel community, is the need for people to connect. And so folks are reading all sorts of articles, and I'm seeing uh, conversations in the comments section. We have people joining us on the Times of Israel community, tuning in to hear from our various reporters and our various writers on all array of topics. We've also invited medical professionals in to share insights into how to build resilience, how to stay healthy at this time. And so one of the opportunities for Times of Israel right now is to find ways virtually to foster that sense of community. And within the human condition within the human spirit and certainly within Judaism is a sense of um, of the community of being together of supporting each other through times of incredible grief and celebrating together during simple through times of joy and since we can't do that in person we have to find ways to do that online and that's also another reason why the blogging platform uh, edited by Miriam Hirschlag and Ann Gordon is such a wonderful opportunity for folks to write in about how they're feeling and their concerns and their stresses, whether they're writing in from the United States, from Minnesota, as you do, Sally, or as I'm doing from my Moshav in the middle of Israel. And, and folks from all backgrounds and walks of life are finding these moments to connect during this time of uncertainty. And so I'm seeing that play out across the site. And David can speak more to the, uh, the coverage that we've been doing and the, and the articles that seem to be gaining traction um, from his perspective. But from the social media perspective that, uh, that I'm overseeing, I see the people are fascinated with the COVID-19 updates. Also, Israelis are watching the developments in the government. We just, uh, Netanyahu just gave, uh, was just given the uh, mandate by the president to, to go ahead uh, moments ago. And we're also seeing um, blogs seem to resonate as people share their most vulnerable thoughts and feelings and fears and hopes for the, the coming days. David, something to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll focus on two things. First of all, how we're actually working. So Sarah's somewhere in Israel, um, somewhere in the center of Israel, and I'm in the office in Jerusalem. And there are two other people, I'm in my office in the office, which is a pretty small office. There's two other people in the newsroom 
which usually at this time of the evening would have probably four people in it, maybe five. Um, our reporters are broadly speaking at home, although as journalists we've been allowed, even in, in the height of the lockdowns, except um, on the first night of Pesach and so on, there were, there were a couple of days where things were really hermetically sealed. But broadly speaking, we've been allowed um, as journalists to, to do our job. But plenty of people have been working from home most of the time. Plenty of people have, have issues. You know, some people have asthma and things that were, that made them a little worried about working. Uh, you know, we're human beings too. And we have had the kids at home, in my case, older kids, but a lot of our staff have younger kids. Uh, some of our staff are married to people who work, who work in the health services. Um, some of our staff have been quarantined because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So all those kinds of things impacting the way we do our work. Uh, I think we've done really well. I mean, um, I'm not saying that to, to, uh, to boast. I'm talking about the, the capacity um, to actually get our job done. We've, we've managed. We've functioned pretty effectively. Um, we've added um, sort of a, new, a, a, a certain amount of additional news reporting capacity. We've, we've been live blogging from first thing in the morning Israel time to very, very late at night Israel time, which means minute by minute updates on things happening. Uh, we do do that even in relatively quiet times. We've done many more hours of that. We've taken on a little bit more reporting staff with a couple of people who have focused uh, um, solely on, on COVID-19 related things. And in terms of what people read and respond to, I mean, one thing that we try to do, we're not perfect and we get stuff wrong and we will have our preconceptions and our biases in everything. But one of the reasons why the Times of Israel, I think, has succeeded and it's only eight years old and it's, you know, it's now being read by, well, we have, we have something like 60 million, six zero million page views in April and something like uh, 10 million unique users. That's a, that's a lot of people. And that suggests uh, a readership um, that, grow, that, that has grown beyond even what we thought the potential universe was um, for a site that is declaredly really covering Israel and the Jewish world and the Middle East. What people respond to is credible information. And those, many of the stories that are, that are most read are the ones that have given people a credible sense of what's going on. We've gone back three times and done Q and A's with one of the um, medical experts who's been helping steer government policy. And we've asked him, I think we asked him 22 questions the first time. Uh, I don't remember what the second time was. Last, last night we put up, or two nights ago, we put up our third interview with him. Um, we've been asking him, you know, the basic questions about what is this virus? Why is it doing what it does? Um, how, we, how should we be facing up to it and so on. Those kinds of stories get, get a huge response. Uh, I spent time at a correct social distance, I must add, with a Hebrew University researcher who's been um, studying ways to tackle um, coronaviruses for years. Um, and the interview I did with him, you know, very, very widely read because people, it, we talked about how this is apparently a relatively simple virus. It's only got you know, two dozen proteins. Uh, there, are, there are many more complicated uh, uh, challenges. And yet, um, it has not been easy to find uh, ways to treat it. There is no vaccine that we, that we are um, on, on, the, on the very edge of at the moment. But, you know, giving people that kind of, of expert insight, I think, has, has been very helpful to people. Um, you know, the, one of the stories that has been, I think, possibly even the most read, if not then one of the most read in the last few weeks, um, you know, you, you, you don't get all of these things exclusively. Uh, I was watching television, I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was probably more than a month ago, about a month ago. And uh, somebody I know very well, who's a, a brilliant Israeli um, polymath, he's the head of Israel's space agency, he's the head of the cyber program at Tel Aviv University, he's a former general in the army. Uh, his name is Yitzhak Ben Yisrael. I mean, he's a genius, in my opinion. And he, he turns up on television one night, um, and he says, listen, I, I'm not a biologist, I don't know anything, <laughs> which is not true, but he basically said, I don't know any, I don't have any expertise in the medical field, but me and my colleague have done a huge statistical analysis of this virus wherever it has struck around the world. And it seems to us that it peaks after 40 days and essentially disappears after 70. I can't tell you why that is, but if you look at the statistics, that seems to be the case. And alongside him in the studio was this incredibly mild and reassuring and really quite lovable um, yes, medical professional. His name is Professor Gavi, Gavi, Gavi Barabash, and he's the former director general of the health ministry, and he's a, a hospital director today. And he's been this calming influence every night on television, telling Israelis what we should worry about and what we should worry about less and so on. 
and he he, he completely lost his cool. And he, he, he was like bursting out of his skin. He was so angry that here's somebody citing statistics. And, and he, he said, you know, it's really fortunate that we're not allowing statisticians and mathematicians to determine when we end our lockdown. And even after um, the, the professor Ben Israel was, was no longer in the studio, Barabash came back to it and, and, a, and a couple of times more was, you know, really very upset. Um, I, I, don't, I can't tell you who's right and who's wrong. Um, but I think uh, um, I, you know, I've been in touch with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Professor Ben uh, Ben Israel, um, who, who then published in you know, the whole study in English, which we which we put on our site, and then a few days ago was saying, you know, Israel should be locking down, should should be easing much more quickly because these seem you know these stats seem to be being borne out. Now, you know, that's fascinating information. I don't know what to make of it. It's fairly credible. And one last thing that I'll say, we we've. we've We've had people all over the place claiming cures and claiming vaccines and claiming to be on the edge of things. Those stories, when, when they're published anywhere in the world, they're very, very resonant. They're very widely read. The requirement, if you're serious about journalism, is to try and distinguish and help your readers distinguish between the credible and the not so credible. Right? The, an example of the not so credible, that would be the guy who's being uh, against whom the health ministry is about to file a police complaint who claims to be able to, to diagnose whether you have the virus over the phone by asking you to cough, right? Um, not, not particularly credible, but there's, there's stuff that's harder to fathom. Um, our defense ministry um, thinks that uh, a state-funded uh, research center is making real progress, and it seems that there is some basis for that with an antibody which may, might lead to a treatment. But we've tried to report even credible things like that with the correct perspective. Well, what does that mean? Are they really ahead of the world? How long will it take and so on? And I think people at a time like this um, respond to credible, uh, calmly presented information. You know, everybody potentially feels themselves to be uh, at threat. And if we've contributed to, to a, a, a credible sense of how worried to be and, and, and also to what we don't know, if we've enabled people to understand, look, there are some things that just aren't known yet. You know, I think that's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that clearly lots of readers of, of our website have responded to. I wanna just interject, because I know, Sally, you have a question. Um, for Sarah, the answer you just gave models why, for me, Times of Israel is such a like essential resource in doing my work for the JCRC, why we wanted to have you as our speaker this year, why we're excited to have you next year, because that, calmness and thoughtfulness and just seriousness to which you answer just that one question I think really is your approach that we see in, in times of Israel in your reporting and you take a situation like Israel or the Middle East or things Jewish or anti-Semitism and people are already have such strong feelings about it you need that kind of measured approach I think otherwise we are always I think at the edge of some sort of like disaster and people getting ahead of themselves. And um, I think a pandemic is like that too, because there's been a lot of false hopes or wishful thinking all over the world on this. And media has a real responsibility to not be, to just be real and, and honest. Um, and, and it's funny, we had, a, we had a question from John Parrott's which we will get to later, he's uh, uh, from our board about how it, Times Israel positions itself on the ideological spectrum. And we can get to that later, but I think more than where it positions itself in the ideological spectrum, I think where it positions itself is it's serious, you know, and it's, it's measured. Um, and that, we're really grateful for that because that's really needed everywhere, but especially in media. Um, so I just wanted to interject that. And, and Sally, I know you had a Kind of more personal question for Sarah about her work as um, as an author. I do, I do. First of all, for those of you that haven't read Sarah's wonderful book and memoir, Jerusalem Drawn and Quartered, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it in Kindle, and you can't say you don't have time right now to read it. I highly recommend it. One of the, the life experiences, Sarah, that you wrote about in this book was about when you were a teenager visiting uh, in Jerusalem and you were assaulted in the old city. Uh, and it took ma many years later, you came back and you worked at conquering that fear of walking in the old city and 
not only did you get over it so that you could walk in the old city, you conquered it to the point where you could live in the old city. I'm wondering uh, if there are some lessons from that experience that will help you, will help us uh, as we deal with our own fears in little by little venturing back out into the world. Sally, I, I love this question. And, uh, it's made me think about it. Uh, about courage and trepidation and that balance. Because I, I'll be honest with you, I like to think of myself as someone who lives courageously and you know, sometimes takes risks. I like to climb rooftops and explore cisterns and look through hidden windows and go through secret doorways. But I've been afraid. And as Israel begins to ease the uh, restrictions here, I find myself suddenly wanting to stay home and wanting to be sheltered within. Um, my, I'm not actually in Jerusalem right now, but my backdrop is a picture of Jerusalem. I'm sitting in my kitchen on the Moshav in central Israel, and I'm longing to return to Jerusalem, but I'm still nervous. But one of the things that I learned through my experience in overcoming my fear is you overcome it step by step, breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. And when I was 18 years old, I was attacked near Damascus Gate, stoned with uh, rocks, and terrified out of my mind. And I promised myself never to go back in the old city, never to set foot inside this place that I loved so much. And yet 15 years later, working for Times of Israel and working with journalist Avi Sahara, he had an assignment to go interview someone from the, uh, the WAC, the Islamic Authority up on Temple Mountain. He asked me to come along and take some photos. And took a deep breath and I said yes, assuming that we would park near the Western Wall entrance and walk in through there and then up through the Mughrabi entrance for non-Muslims and through Temple Mount through security and all of that. And instead he parked all the way on the other side of the old city by Damascus Gate. I didn't want to get out of the car. I didn't want to leave my safe space, but I took a breath and I took that first step. And as I stepped forward at one after the other, it began to get easier. And so that's how I'm approaching this. I'm also looking for meaning in all of this. Victor Frankl wrote beautifully on this, this uh, psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust, about those who find meaning and purpose during the most unbelievably excruciatingly terrifying, difficult times, find ways to thrive afterward. And so that's another thing that I'm doing to try to overcome the fear is to look for meaning and purpose in each moment, even in my own fright, even in my own sadness, even as I am going you, through this process. So, you you wanted to wrote, You wrote a beautiful prayer, Sarah, that you posted on Facebook yesterday, really beautiful, about when that time comes and how we approach it. And maybe if... Um, if there's time at the end, that might be a really nice way to close is, you know, to do the thank yous that of course we want to do, but maybe to close with that, if you can find it on your phone and you'd be willing to read it, uh, that would be a really meaningful way to, to finish when it's time. I'd be honored, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ethan, the next question is yours. Right, this is a question for David. Um, so there's a lot of analogizing to this current crisis as a war. But of course, the, the people in the front lines are not soldiers, it's, it's healthcare workers. Um, and in Israel, um, disproportionately, and I mean this in the best possible way, the non-Jewish Israelis and the, how they refer to themselves or how we refer to them, there's a lot of, there's a lot into that, right? So we'll just say the non-Jewish Israelis for now. Um, disproportionately are doctors and nurses and healthcare workers. And I've been on Times of Israel community um, Zoom webinars like, like this, where some of your reporters have talked about um, how it's drawing like a deeper sense of Israeliness or Israeli identity in these, these, these Arab Israelis or Palestinian Israelis or however they, they want to refer to themselves. And part because of this crisis, because of the value of their work, I'm curious how that's working out. And, you know, the prime minister has been criticized in the past for kind of demagoguing against Israel's non-Jewish population. But, you know, is there just like this opportunity for, for healing um, because of the invaluable work, the leadership that we've seen um, from, from non-Jewish Israelis being on the front lines of this war against 
against COVID-19? It's a very good question, and I don't know that I have a definitive answer. I don't think that um, the big political picture um, ha will, will have changed, uh, even though there's been you know, sort of life and death interaction, uh, because I think the big political picture was always was was full of nuance and people. Yeah, you know, they may shift a little bit along along the spectrum. Um, what I think is is worth stressing is that is 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 underlining your point. Um, Israelis knew this, but we've encountered it maybe more, and much of the rest of the world didn't, um, that this is a country with, yeah, Jewish majority, 71% um, Jewish, I think, in the pre-independence day statistics, 5% other, I think they said, and 24% Arab, something like that. Um, um, you know, very substantial Jewish majority, um, and, uh, um, and a, um, a, a sizable non-Jewish minority. Um, who are overrepresented in the in the in the health system? Um, hospital directors, you know, who are Israeli Arabs, Palestinian Israelis, as you say, however however they want to define themselves. Um, in the um, in the first response, in Magen David Adom, uh, ambulance crews, Arabs, Jews, uh, secular Jews, ultra Orthodox Jews, um, you know, some of the some of the top experts who've been you know really very smart and, and, and helping people understand things, certainly not from the Jewish community in Israel. Um, again, we've, we've known a lot of this, we felt it more directly now maybe, and I think a lot of the rest of the world has discovered it. In terms of how we get on, uh, Israelis get on pretty well. Uh, polit the politics can be very divisive, and I'm not sure uh, how much this changes. Maybe it, maybe it warms the sort of social relationships, but I'm not sure that it will have any long-term political impact. What, on, on the political field, which I don't need to go into in any great length, mm. uh, we did see a process of um, Arab Israelis becoming, or, or thinking they were uh, becoming disenfranchised and a kind of self-fulfilling process of falling turnout in elections. Um, and Netanyahu certainly was uh, um, uh, prone to trying to, whip, to, to get at his vote by asserting that the Arab uh, minority was voting in relatively high numbers. And therefore, you, you saw this process of decline, but it was reversed in the last two elections. In the last two elections, the turnout went up, the turnout went up in the, in the Arab community to the point where um, in the current Knesset, which is about to form its government, um, the joint list of four mainly Arab parties has a, a record 15 seats. Now, they will be in the opposition. There's a limit to how much uh, influence you can have in the opposition, but it is a, a greater influence than if you were 10 or 13 seats, which is where they were um, three and, and two elections ago. Um, so the, the, um, the political uh, um, battling will continue. Knesset members, certainly from the Arab community, I would say some of them have tended to be fairly extreme. And again, this is the difference. Local council leaders in the Arab community have tended, terrible generalizations I'm making here, but you get the point, have tended to be very focused on the interests of their, of their residents, making sure that uh, um, there's the, the sewage systems are working and the buses are running. And you've seen it in this crisis as well. You've seen that just like this virus knows no borders, well, tackling it uh, has to be done. It has to be mutual trust within the community. And that you've seen. Uh, I don't think Israel, I don't think Israel's uh, uh, chiefs would say that they were perfect in their outreach to all the sectors of the, of the demographic. And they would count, they would probably say the ultra-Orthodox community, the communication was really not as good as it should have been. And in parts of the Arab community, the communication was not as good to the point where, where you had some uh, cases where Arab towns and villages in Israel locked themselves down before the government at the sort of national level had realized that they were becoming epicenters because they wanted to limit the spread of the virus, right? They realized they had a high number of cases they close off their own roads in a couple of cases early on in this crisis. And that, you know, you can look at that certainly as part of uh, a, a phenomenon to some extent, I would say certainly, of, of communal trust and mutual shared responsibility that probably was one of the other factors that has helped Israel, relatively speaking, do so well in keeping this virus at bay. Sarah, let's go back to you. Let's pick up on the um, on the thread that we're dealing with here about how relationships uh, change during this pandemic, how they might be strengthened. And uh, so 
I'm going to ask you a, a related question uh, regarding the often fraught relations between uh, Israeli Jews and American Jewish communities. Can this be a time where we draw closer together despite our differences, as the scholar Avraham Infeld once said, unity without uniformity? Uh, how can each community, both traumatized by loss of lives and loss of livelihood, how can we support each other? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and after Sarah, David, uh, on, on what this might mean for our relationship as the two largest uh, global Jewish communities. Oh, I, I love this question and it's one I have been wrestling with for years ever since I, I came to Israel. I am an American and I am an Israeli and I hold both of these identities as sacred and as true and bridging them is sometimes difficult. And late, lately, in the, in the last few years, with uh, all the, amidst the political turmoil, that relationship between my community in the United States and the diaspora and my community here in Israel seems especially fraught. And so I've always been looking for ways to build that bridge. One of the things I've stressed time and time again and spoke about when I was visiting you in Minnesota two years ago is you have to come to Israel. You have to walk our streets and meet our people and listen to the myriad of opinions, some of which, some of the opinions you're not going to like, but fall in love with the Israel of the land, of the different folks, of the, of the Jews, of the Arabs, of the religious, of the secular, of all the different people from all backgrounds and from all opinions. Get into arguments and then come out as friends. Start with one conversation, and if that conversation leads to a second and a third and a fourth, that's the basis for friendship and caring and for mutual trust and for moving forward to build a better future. The problem is we can't meet in person right now. It's frustrating, but we have all these incredible tools at our hands. Right now, we are doing this webinar on Zoom, and we're connecting with each other from, you know, across how many times? Eight, eight time zones? Eight, we're across eight time zones right now, and yet we are sharing this moment and there is intimacy in that and this is this is part of a relationship continuum and, um, and for others who are just starting on that can be the beginning of a relationship every sunday night i have a zoom meeting with my family i'm so homesick for my aunt and uncle and cousins and father and his wife that you know, we set this up and every sunday at 10 o'clock in the evening israel time we sign on and three hours later we, we get off the call and I realized that this is the first time in years that I've spent this much time with my family. And it's also wonderful because it's the first time since they left America that my children are getting to really know this part of their family. And so these kinds of conversations can lead to, to that intimacy, to that friendship, to the more difficult conversations about the, the fate of the Jewish people with all our tribes. As we, as we move forward as one under one tent in our different locations and from our different vantage points and with our different feelings about things. As long as we're still talking to each other, as long as we're still hugging and wrestling, whether it's in person or virtually with each other, then that connection will be deepened. That connection will continue to, to sustain us and will even thrive beyond what it is now. We're also in this unique moment of uh, the first time that, at least in my memory, of both communities experiencing the same crisis at the same time. It's not one-sided as like, you know, we can think of examples where it was only one of us. It's both of us, it's all of us. And we're able to share advice, we're able to hold space for the other. Every evening at 11 p.m. I get a reminder that I have to sign on to a virtual all-gender minion with some a woman in New York I've never met her before, but her mother died. And so I'm there along with whoever else is able to join and we're holding that space and saying Kaddish and then you know, it, it branches out into conversations about different ways we're coping with the crisis and we give each other advice and we're, whether it's sharing recipes or sharing tips on how to just make it through the day in one piece. We are creating these different communities out of this, out of fear comes this these communities of of love and shared responsibility and, and real uh, friendship and connection. David, anything to add? Yeah, I just I just say um, that I think that the you know you're absolutely right. We're here. We are. We're, we're sharing the same battle, um, mm -hmm. and I think we should learn um, 
a lesson of, of a, a required better institutionalized forum of communication. You know, at, at a personal level, you know, the more the better, obviously. Um, but I, you know, I think there's been a, too much, especially given the potential for this kind of way to communicate, there's been too much of a disconnect between Israel and the diaspora. There have been too many misunderstandings. Uh, I've talked about this for a long time. Um, I don't think that means that diaspora should be telling Israel what to do and vice versa, but there should be better communication on lots of things, including, you know, things that relate to, to the, the uh, prayer at the Western Wall, um, all kinds of things. But on this, you know, I, I think that, that we could have done better if we, and I'm talking about the, the leaderships and the smart people in communities world, worldwide, um, had communicated more effectively. You know, I, I remember when this was playing out, I was actually talking to an to a American Jewish communal leadership. I was talking about, you know, we're, we're really, you know, battening down here and closing off. And I, and I could tell they didn't quite get it because the United States was a few days, I think, I'll, I'll be generous and say a few days, uh, maybe behind Israel on some, on some things. Um, and I think you know, Netanyahu spoke to world leaders. I don't know uh, uh, exactly who he spoke to. Sebastian Kurz in, uh, in Austria has said, basically it was Netanyahu who shook him up to the point that they took very strict measures very early on. I think there was some communication, but I think it probably could have been better and we should learn from it. I'm very struck the South African Jewish community, uh, I don't want to jinx anything, God forbid, but they seem to have done spectacularly well. Part of that, I think there was real expertise in the community. Uh, but we, you know, we, we've done some reporting on this and we're not the only people. Um, they, they, they realized very early and there should, there should be mechanisms. Let's try and be constructive uh, going forward. Where when there's wisdom, we should be sharing it more effectively. When there's insight, when, you know, broadly speaking, the dialogue is good. But at, at a time like this, you, you really, it, it, has, it underlines that the more effective the, the communication, you know, in, in, in cases like this, you really, you'll be saving lives. To the spirit of what you just said about communication and cooperation, we thought we'd do something that's not typical on a webinar where we usually, you know, the hosts are asking the guests questions, but we thought maybe you'd like to ask us a question and we can model uh, for the people listening, you know, what it means to have it be a, a two-way conversation. So go for it. I'd love to know how you're doing. How, how's your community handling all of this and how are you feeling? both personally and, and uh, both you, Sally, and Ethan, and also for, for everybody in, your, uh, in the Jewish community there in Minnesota. We're, uh, I feel in Minnesota, we're fortunate because we can see elsewhere in our country where uh, people are much worse off. Um, I'm personally worried about just, you know, the the country you are going into a crisis is the same country you have when you experience the crisis. And it will reveal the best things and the worst things and the, the most challenging things. And so we've been divided um, in the United States and in large part on geographic lines, I think, somewhat on, on, on many other fault lines. And this is, we had, we had a few weeks, I think, at the beginning of more unity and now I'm, I'm, we're seeing more fracturing. and it's concerning. It's um, maybe this is a luxury to say, I feel more concerned about our just civic democracy about our, as a people, as I am for my own health or that of my family. And maybe that's because I'm sitting in Minnesota and not New York city. But um, I, I think that we we're at a difficult point right now as a country because um, we are already afraid. And, and this in some ways is kind of, picking at that. Um, it's funny because Israel, I mean, obviously you've had a lot of political divisions. You have had three elections and yet, you know, you seem to have been more united on this. It, it may just be the nature of being in Israel and being in the Middle East and types of threats that you have and you know how to come together when you need to. Um, we're, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's concerning. But personally, I'm doing really well. And so thank you for asking. <laughs> Same here, we're doing well, we're antsy, um, but the communal question and the communal worry that's on my mind is, 
um, related to what I have taught Israeli children when I've been in Israeli schools and gone to speak to them about what is it like to be a Jew that doesn't live in Israel and to help them understand how, uh, how intentional we have to be. It's, we don't, you know, we don't live on Jewish time in a Jewish environment. And we, if we want Judaism to happen, we have to make it happen. Uh, and we need our communal institutions, our synagogues and our JCCs and our summer camps, which are, you know, we just got news yesterday of our beloved Herzl camp, you know, one of many Jewish summer camps that's, you know, sleepaway camps. These are formative experiences for our Jewish kids. And it's, it's not going to open this summer, you know, because of what's going on. And I'm, we're waiting to hear about the others. It's even though you suspect it's coming, it's like a kick in the guts when you get the message anyway. Um, so I worry about how we um, maintain the communal institutions that are necessary for building Jewish life um, out here. Uh, that's uh, that's my my global worry, you know. Aside from the worries that everybody has about just staying well in this uh, frightening time. If we know of any children who want to connect with Israeli children uh, on Zoom, um, please be in touch. I've got two of them at home who uh, would love to practice their English as a way of keeping some of that connection going. And uh, so it won't be summer camp, but it will be. It could be a friendship. You'll be hearing from us about You'll be that. hearing from us for sure, yeah. For sure. For That's sure. an open invitation to any panelists listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we move to the Q&A, Ethan? Do you want to tee up a question? Uh, sure. So we had a lot of good questions. And um, so I want to get back to John's question, because I think we've been talking a lot about Times of Israel. Um, so. Do you perceive Times of Israel to be moderate? I, I think that's the perception that maybe is out there in the public. Or do you reject that frame that, you know, you're not looking to have an ideological place in the spectrum? Because I think that there's this perception that there are, are other English language outlets in Israel that are more to the left, and there are others which are more to the right. Um, is, that, is that laziness on our part to say, oh, yes, Times of Israel is that moderate voice? Or um, do, you, do you understand why people might think that? So just kind of David, I mean, this is your baby, this is your creation. I don't know if this was that, if that was what you were like, yes, that's, that was what we wanted to be. Um, but how do you, how do you respond to that perception, at least that Times Israel is like this moderate English language voice coming from Israel? Well, I, I, if that's how it seems, it's, uh, and if that's how it's seen, I, uh, that's great. Uh, that was central to the strategy and the imperative. Um, I wanted it to be, Inclusive. Um, I'm not sure I would use the word centrist, but inclusive. Um, I, I don't want to know the politics of our reporters. I want their work to be fair minded. There's no such thing as absolute truths, but you can strive to be objective. Uh, our blog platform is spectacularly diverse. Um, you know, you'll have people weighing in across the spectrum on issues, but within parameters that we <coughs> set up that we try to hold to. Uh, we, we try to avoid incitement and extremism and, 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 and so on. Um, so it's very important to me. Um, we, we all have our opinions um, and I write opinion pieces. Um, and, uh, you know, on, on this call uh, and, and in writing, I'll say it again. And it's interesting in response to some of the things that were said earlier about how people feel, feel in America, you know, without taking a position on that. I think one of the reasons why Israel has, has performed quite well uh, in the last few weeks is there has been a sense of competent leadership and the person front and center has been the prime minister and I, I give him immense credit for that. Uh, you haven't had much arguing in Israel about whether we've been doing the right thing. There's a great deal of economic fallout. I mean, there's a real economic meltdown, but, um, and, and there's a lot of arguing about that and people are very, very upset and the process of compensation and grants and so on has not been good. But broadly speaking, uh, people feel that in terms of saving lives, this has been effective. A lot of the credit for that goes to Netanyahu, who I have also been very critical of and, 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 and will be in, in, in other areas, uh, including for, for uh, um, discrediting um, the hierarchies of law enforcement or seeking to really, uh, as he battles um, uh, the corruption charges against him. His trial starts in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, there's, there's, I think people if they read enough of the site um, and are concluding that we're trying to be fair, that's great. Uh, we get criticized from left and from right. 
which I regard as a necessary but not sufficient condition. In other words, if we weren't getting it from both sides, I'd know there was something wrong. But the fact that we're getting it from both sides doesn't prove that there isn't something wrong. But we, we try. Uh, and we have a pretty diverse staff who live just where you live in Israel. You know, do you, which side of the pre-67 line do you live? Well, we have people on both sides of, of the line. Uh, we have Orthodox and secular people on our staff. Uh, we run an Arabic version of the site. Um, you know, all, all the people involved in the various things we do, uh, we have a French version of the site. They, br they bring different perspectives and they create an environment in which we, we are aware of what different people in different parts of different spectrums are thinking. And I think that impacts uh, everything we do. And I stress again, we're not perfect and we do get stuff wrong and we do have our biases, but we do strive to be fair-minded. And, and I think, you know, obviously it's very gratifying if, if that's the way we're, we're perceived. Sarah, so I've got a question for yeah. you uh, from Lee Waterman. A, a question for Sarah. That was the one I was gonna ask too, yeah, for Sarah, yeah. Uh, how has this experience changed the way you parent, if at all? Hi, hi Lee, it's wonderful to see your question here. I love connecting with you on Facebook. And so thank you for your question. When, um, when I was a new mom, I was anxious all the time. I was terrified. I, uh, you know, I saw a flea once on the couch and I called the pediatrician to ask if my daughter would get bubonic plague. I wish I was kidding. This is actually true. And Dr. Seifert, if you're listening in, you can uh, back me up on this. But after the anxiety came a sense of emptiness and I missed being in the moment with my children. I just wanted the time to pass. I felt so exhausted emotionally, physically, just completely wasted of energy. And when the lockdown began here and when the crisis really began, um, I started to feel that old anxiety creep back. And I had a feeling that the anxiety would be followed by this, this emptiness. And so I decided to try to take steps to combat that make sure that I was as present as possible with my kids. One of my regrets as a mom was missing those early years because I was so frightened and then so checked out. And so as this began, I put a lot of effort into being in the moment, into feeling everything as it came, including the negative feelings, the frustration, the anger, and the sadness, and the fear, but also making time to have the crazy dance parties in the living room and to grabbed my daughter's acrylic paints and we, we painted all the chairs in the kitchen bright colors to bring some vividness and life into this space. And we've been spending a lot more time together, I mean, a lot more time. This is I think, the first time really in, in human history where parents have not had villages supporting them uh, for the most part. Grandparents are not allowed to come over. We're not supposed to hire babysitters. So there's been that really focused, intense time, which has been it's been a gift, it's been a blessing, and it's also been exhausting and frustrating, but I continue to remind myself to be in the moment and to feel all of those things and let them wash through me so that I remember it and so that I can say, I am here. And then when this passes, and it will pass, I can look back and say, I was there. That's how this has changed the way I think. So we, we don't have, too much time left. And so I want to ask David one last question uh, from our, our participants. And then I think we could end with, um, Sarah, if you feel comfortable sharing the, the, the poem, I think that would be an uplifting kind of way to, to end this. Um, but before David, I ask you this question, I just want to, again, thank both of you um, for participating in this. I want to thank our, our audience of, of people who have tuned in and, 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 and stayed with us. We can, we can track that. And it's, it's really encouraging to see so many people have are, are interested. I um, want to extend um, kind of greetings and thanks from our, our board chair, Marty Chester, our executive director, Steve Honigs, um, and then our colleagues who like our admission control at their own homes, um, Sandy and Anthony and Ellen, who've been working together to put this living room series. And I promise I do this, not that you asked, but I really want to plug Times Israel's community um, because if you've enjoyed this, this session, Sarah does these at least a couple times a week with Times of Israel um, reporters or other interesting people, sometimes with David, and they're, they're really great. And it's a wonderful way to support quality journalism. Um, but I didn't want to spend this entire hour 
without talking about politics a little bit. Um, and we've, we've gotten some questions about annexation. And I, and I woke up this morning and there was a, an op-ed in the, in the New York Times from Daniel Pipes, who is as conservative as, as they come as right. I mean, he is really, really conservative. And he was basically laying out this almost with one exception, the same case that someone like J Street would make as to why annexation is a, is a bad idea. And I'm hearing about this on, from uh, contacts on Capitol Hill and my, my work as a lobbyist for the JCRC. So are we overly concerned about this sitting here in the United States? Is this type one of those like campaign promises that probably won't actually come to fruition? What is your sense, David, um, about like what we're gonna see over the next months with respect to annexation? Um, and then after that, we'll just go right to, um, Sally wants to have a few other words to Sarah for, for kind of a closing poem. Okay, so um, what do I think? Uh, the deal that, uh, that Netanyahu and Gantz signed uh, really rules out much major legislation in the first, um, the first few months, but the one exception is the potential for annexation. From July the 1st, Netanyahu is free under the coalition deal to advance his declared goal of extending sovereignty to all the settlements and um, the Jordan Valley, um, maybe 25-30% of the West Bank, within the provisions of the Trump uh, Peace to Prosperity vision. Uh, is he going to go ahead and do that? Uh, if you listen to him, yes he is. Is the United States going to back him, um, subject to Netanyahu accepting the Trump plan and, and various, uh, there's, there's a mapping process that goes on, but it would appear from the comments made by various officials, including the, the American ambassador to Israel this week, that the United States will back Netanyahu in doing that. That doesn't mean for sure that he's going to do it, but um, that's, the, uh, um, that's the declared intention. Uh, I'm somebody who supports the two-state solution. I, it was the basis on which historic Israel was revived. Um, I think we need to find a way to separate from millions of, of very hostile, less hostile, potentially hostile, uh, Palestinians. I want to keep a Jewish majority. By the way, I, get, I, get, I want to correct the numbers. I didn't give you the right numbers. Israel, 74% Jewish, 5% other, 21% Arab. That's the, the population breakdown. I want to keep our big Jewish majority here. Um, uh, and I want to keep our democracy, so we're going to have to separate. I don't think we can do that now. When we relinquish adjacent territory, the, the, the reality has been bad things happen. South Lebanon, we've had wars and, and all kinds of incidents. Gaza, we left Gaza, you know, terrible escalations and, 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 and wars, awful. Uh, it's not easy to relinquish adjacent territory. I don't think we can do it yet. I don't think we can do it in the foreseeable future, but I wouldn't want to close the door on it. And that's one of the concerns, um, not with annexing su some areas, but some of the areas provided for. There's 15, uh, what are called communal, I think they're called enclave communities, settlements, inside the entity that the US plan provides for becoming Palestinian. Is it possible to have Israeli sovereignty in those communities and keep alive any future potential possibility of viable separation from the Palestinians? So I think those are some of the questions that are, that, uh, that, that are worth asking um, as, as, we, as we see how this plays out in the next weeks. And we know that you'll be asking those questions and, and writing about it and your colleagues at the Times Israel. David, I understand that you have to jump off this call to go to another another Zoom call, but um, I, I, so we thank you. We thank you so much. We so look forward to seeing you next June. Um, but Sarah, uh, David, so you, you can leave if you, if you, if you need to. And, and, but we do, Sarah, want to hear your poem because I, I think it's, it's beautiful and I think it will, um, you try to find some moments in the day of, of uplift. You know, for me yesterday, it was playing with my two-year-old neighbor from a safe physical distance and perhaps today it's a poem. Yeah, it's a fitting way to end. A yeah. Hopeful and um, spiritual and uplifting way to end. So please go for it. Thank you so much. Dear spirit of the universe, source of life and energy and love in the farthest cosmos and deep within, you who has given us life, sustained us and brought us to this moment, Grant me the courage to open myself to the world gently, to unfold with cautious optimism and to face the challenges ahead with loving kindness. Grant me the resilience to take the first steps out the door and into busy streets, to send my children off to school, to go to work, to see friends, and not be afraid to hug them. Grant me the wisdom to know the difference between caution and irrational fear, to know when to offer help to those who need and to know when I am struggling and need to ask for help as well. 
and grant me the gentleness to react slowly when I am angry and, sw and swiftly when there are words of comfort that are needed and to be especially kind to myself so I can be kind to others on this new path we are all, all walking together. Thank you and thank you for allowing me to feel that you are here beside me as I take one step in front of the other with everyone else. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sally. It's been a pleasure to do this with you. And thank you to everyone who's who's tuned in and our partners at Minneapolis, St. Paul Jewish Generations, uh, the Israel Center, and of course, DCG folks. So thank you, everyone. Um, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful spending this time with you and connecting from very far apart um, through Zoom. Yeah. Thank you, Ethan and Sally. Good to see you in Israel. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everybody. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.